Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 95, Revelation, The Harvest is Ripe. And in this episode, we are going to finish Revelation chapter 14 by looking at verses 14 through 20. And I spent a little bit more time this week trying to articulate something that might sound a little bit new to you, at least as the way I am trying to look at these depictions of judgment, some of them being quite gruesome, in fact, and then to remind us again of where we've been and where Revelation is headed in terms of always wanting to interpret images in the book of Revelation through who we know Jesus to be and who we know God to be as he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus. And so um, I do want you to follow along. I think this will be an encouraging episode to you. I find it to be very relevant even to the time in which we are living today in our society. And so I am excited to wrap up chapter 14 with you. And so let's just jump right into it. To begin this week's episode, allow me just to read Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called out with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Now just to begin our time here as we're thinking about this image of a harvest, um, to remind you, in Matthew chapter 9... Jesus connected for his disciples um, the idea that the harvest refers to people and that his disciples were encouraged to spread the kingdom in places where people, um, the harvest, were ready to receive it, or in other words, where the harvest was ripe. And several chapters later in Jesus's parable of the weeds from Matthew 13, he offered an explanation to his disciples regarding how it is that some whose ways are not in line with the kingdom of God come to be mixed in with those whose ways are in line with God's kingdom. And Jesus tells his disciples that an enemy came while his men were sleeping and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. And he then offers his disciples the interpretation of his parable. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Now, it seems that our passage in Revelation 14 is describing this promised reality. And, you know, although we've come to expect, um, as we've seen throughout Revelation, though, John always seems to add his own particular little flavor to how many people assumed these realities would come about. And so let's just make some observations if we can. The description that John gives us of the one like a son of man seated on a cloud certainly makes us think of Jesus himself, although the description of this same figure in verse 19 tells us that it's an angel. So one of the questions we might pose as we begin this episode is, is this Jesus being described or is this an angel? And the truth is, it's really hard to tell. And yet ultimately, it it doesn't really matter. 
Um, the meaning and the significance here is not altered either way. In Jesus's parable of the weeds, he tells us that the reapers are angels and that the Son of Man will send his angels. So there's a very tight-knit connection here between the Son of Man and the messengers that he sends to do his work. So tight-knit, in fact, that this particular angel, Revelation 14, actually looks like Jesus. So I don't think, then, that we really have to decide whether this first reaper is Jesus or one of his angels. And trust me, there is enough disagreement here amongst commentators that I'm not really sure it's worth our time to argue decidedly for one over the other. Bottom line, the end has come. The harvest is ripe. It's time to reap the harvest. Now, one of the most obvious issues um, facing us has to do with whether there are two different harvests um, directed at two different groups of people or whether both harvests describe the same event in two different ways or any other number of possible alternatives. Um, who is John referring to here? And why does he describe these harvests the way that he does? One of wheat and the other of grapes. Are we supposed to look specifically here for literal descriptions of the way in which the end will come? And does John intend for us to bring anything else we've come to understand about the Son of Man into our understanding of how to interpret these scenes? Well, I think by now you can probably guess that yes, John intends for us to bring what we know of the Son of Man into our understanding of what's going on here. And no, John does not expect us to look specifically for literal descriptions of the way in which the end will come. I'm aware that many readers of Revelation think this is exactly what we should be doing, but that is a failure to read and to interpret apocalyptic language correctly. And besides, there are parts of reading literally that simply make no sense logically. For example, in verse 11 of Revelation 14, which we looked at last week, we are told that the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Now, that is an image of final judgment, particularly with the use of the words forever and ever. But then in verse 20, in another description of final judgment, we read that the blood flowed from the winepress. Now, the smoke of their torment, and this is not torture, mind you, but torment, and we've spoken at length regarding torture being something that comes to, to you and is afflicted upon you from the outside, Torment is something that has um, arises from the inside when something that you love has been taken away from you. So, so keep this in mind here. It says the smoke of their torment. This is not torture. This is torment. This depicts a scene of burning judgment, right? It's, it's an ash heap of sorts that is just smoldering continually. But how does one squeeze blood from an ash heap, as verse 20 seems to indicate? You don't, which is why it bears repeating that these images simply make no sense if we try to interpret them literally. Furthermore, it's disturbing, to say the least, to attribute to God and the Lamb the same vindictive attributes that pagan gods are known for. If the incarnation of Jesus Christ has taught us anything, if God's glory being revealed by Jesus on the cross in his self-emptying, dying for one's enemies kind of love as the perfect expression of the Lord himself, then we would have to think long and hard about whether or not we believe the Lord really revealed himself in Jesus Christ, or if perhaps instead he revealed himself in that way for a time, but eventually the true God will show himself and his truly vindictive nature will come through. Now, as I've read Revelation... I simply cannot see this as the case. God revealed himself as the lamb, and he exercises his power and his judgment as the lamb, and only as such. Remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, a clue, I think, to help us navigate just who it is John has in mind by these two descriptions of ripe harvests shows up in the two verses immediately before our passage. Uh, we read these, actually, as part of last week's episode, but allow me just to read them again for you here. It's verses 12 and 13 of Revelation 14. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. 
those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Now, verse 12, I think is clearly an exhortation to faithful witness. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. The reason? Because the harvest is coming. Jesus will bring out the wheat and his faithful followers will enter into his presence forever. This is the hope. This is what people are looking forward to. But the way verses 17 to 20 are given to us, we would think that this particular harvest, the one speaking of the blood and the wine press and trampling, you know, um, the, the blood flowing from the wine press for 1600 stadia, we would think that this particular harvest is for the wicked of the earth. After all, God's wrath is in view in these verses and quite a gruesome picture of his wrath, I might add. So what do we make of this? Who is John describing here? Some commentators that I came across are convinced that this is simply a description of the coming judgment of the wicked. They will face the fierce wrath of God. Their blood will literally be squeezed out of them and it will flow as high as a horse's bridle for over 180 miles. Now, to be sure, judgment is certainly coming on the wicked. In fact, Revelation depicts repeatedly the idea that the sinful ways of the wicked will be turned back on their own heads. We will see this a lot, particularly in Revelation 18. But is the God who revealed himself in Jesus a God who will squeeze blood out of the wicked like grapes in a wine press? Is this who we know him to be? Now, in terms of judgment, yes, God will judge those who oppose him. This has always been the case. But in terms of the way in which God will judge them, not so fast. So let's look at things a little bit more closely. Notice that in both harvests, the reapers swing their sickles across the earth. The entire earth is in view in both scenes. But notice that in this description of the wine press, John tells us that it was trodden outside the city. Now, a question I hope you're asking, I certainly want to ask as I'm reading through Revelation is, why the shift from a focus on the whole earth to focusing in on a single city? Well, if we tie this in with verse 13, which says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, we begin to get a slightly different image. To be honest, Verse 13 seems a little bit out of place to me. Why the reference to people dying in the Lord here? The wheat harvest is about Jesus gathering his people to himself, and the grape harvest seems to highlight God's wrath being poured out on the wicked. What then does this have to do with the faithful being blessed for dying in the Lord? The answer, I think, can be found in John's use of the words outside the city. These words do appear to only apply to the enemies of God, particularly as the gruesome images of rivers of blood seem to indicate. But it's not the first time words like these appear in the New Testament. Listen to Hebrews 13, 12 to 14. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Now, if you add Hebrews 13 to Romans 14, we've got three different phrases. Exact same idea. Outside the city, outside the gate, and outside the camp. Now, in the Hebrews passage, this is clearly referring to Jesus being crucified outside the city of Jerusalem. And I don't know if you would call it irony. I don't know if you would call it hypocrisy or a strange mix of both. But clearly, Jesus' murder was too unclean to take place within the city limits, right? So the religious leaders make sure it takes place outside the city. Yeah, hypocrisy, um, irony, I think they both kind of get at this point. But the author to the book of Hebrew, to the letter to the Hebrews, is exhorting his listeners to go to Jesus outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. And then the author of Hebrews continues the city language by contrasting two cities. 
For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Now this is intriguing to me. Because in Revelation 14, 13, John exhorts the church with the words, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, and then proceeds to explain a judgment of God that takes place outside the city. The same designation Hebrews uses to describe not only where Jesus was crucified, but also where he is exhorting his listeners to go. So are these final verses in Revelation 14 talking about God's judgment of the wicked Or are they talking about the part his own people will somehow play in bringing about redemption to the nations, as we saw so clearly in Revelation 11? Answer? I don't know. There. I said it. I'm going to ride the fence and simply say, I don't know. And that's okay. Because I can see both emphasis here. And part of me truly does wonder if that's not the point. We are talking about a city, and we are talking about judgment happening outside the city. In fact, if we continue to look forward in the book of Revelation, we may get some clarification. As we've already seen throughout the book, oftentimes themes and ideas are introduced in earlier chapters of Revelation with little or no accompanying explanation or clarification. For example, seven times we heard or read the phrase, to the one who conquers, in the addresses to each of the seven churches without ever being told what it actually meant to conquer in the first place. It wasn't until we got to Revelation 5 and heard the lion of the tribe of Judah as one who conquered were we given any indication of what that term even meant. Or in chapter 11, we heard about the beast that makes war on the two witnesses and conquers them and kills them, but it wasn't until chapter 13 that we were even told who and what this beast was. I think the same thing is happening here. We are introduced to this idea of a city, and it is an image John will stick with throughout the remainder of the book, placing it side by side with Babylon, what he will call the great city. The city being referred to in our passage, however, is none other than the Mount Zion, already mentioned in Revelation 14, the holy city, the New Jerusalem already mentioned in the address to the Christians in Philadelphia. And in a verse that we have referenced too many times to count, it says this explicitly. Let me read to you again, Revelation 3.12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. And then in typical Revelation fashion, the promises to the ones who conquer show up again at the end of the book, showing that the faithful actually do receive those promises and thereby exhorting those listening to the book to endure to the end and so prove themselves faithful and so that they may also partake of the promises and the blessings provided at the beginning of the book. So listen to Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. You see, judgment takes place outside the city, outside the gate, and outside the camp. And in the holy city, New Jerusalem, there will be no more death. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things will have passed away. Or if we flip forward one more chapter to the final chapter in Revelation, the final chapter in the Bible, listen to Revelation 22, 14 to 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Now, here's our word again, outside. 
Having just spoken about those who entered the city, it's fairly obvious that what's being spoken about here are those outside the city. Now, what's necessary, I think, to point out is the way Revelation speaks about this kind of reality. And Josh Butler highlighted this point for us in our By the Book conversation that aired several weeks ago. He quoted Zechariah chapter 2, 14 to 15, which says, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. So you see, here Zechariah is looking forward to this new Jerusalem. His emphasis is on the abundance of people who will be there the multitude of people, and even the livestock in it. But then in verse 5, he describes the Lord's protection. I'm sorry, in verse 15, he describes the Lord's protection of this new city. I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. In other words, the Lord's presence will be experienced differently by those outside the city, a wall of fire all around, than by those inside the city, the Lord will be the glory in her midst. And perhaps this difference is why John needs to remind his hearers and readers that those who die in the Lord from this point on are blessed, not cursed, despite the fact that their deaths occur outside the city. The Spirit echoes this blessing, however, in Revelation 14, because through their death, they will enter into true rest. And so this is what John is describing He's exhorting his hearer readers to be faithful to the end, even if it involves death. And I think he's mixing metaphors throughout in order both to promise the faithful that true judgment awaits their enemies, but also the reality that it may in fact be their suffering and or even their death that will be the basis for their enemy's judgment. We've come to see now repeatedly throughout Revelation that based upon the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that judgment and salvation are oftentimes two sides of the same coin. Now, this is certainly counter to the way we normally think about these realities, but that only goes to show just how much of Jesus we continually need revealed to us. That is, after all, the entire point of of the book of Revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ as the opening verse to the book states. And then as Revelation 19.10 reminds us, particularly as it relates to prophecies of the future, like the ones we are looking at in Revelation 14, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And it's important that we remember this when we read every single passage in this book. Now, I can think of several reasons why this might matter today. In our time right now, politically, societally, socially, etc., we are experiencing serious tensions. And one thing is becoming painfully clear to me and more and more certain in the minds of many, many people, and that is this, that if you are not on my side or you do not see things my way, then you are the enemy. And the more polarized we become, the more heated we get while eagerly awaiting judgment for the other side in whatever form we imagine that might take. And I've heard this spoken about in the church, eagerly anticipating when the leftists or the liberals or the communists or those from other countries or those who detract against the president or whoever are in fact going to get what's coming to them. And what is happening is we have an extremely divided cultural situation on our hands, one that rests firmly in a who's in, who's out mindset. It's always been like this. And if you jump ship and join a different perspective, then you end up looking back on the ship you just came from and being like, oh, I used to think those people were in, but now I realize those people are out. And we create divisions and love breaks down. And people harden their hearts against those who aren't like them. And the divisions continue to increase. The good people we believe are in, however we choose to define in. And the bad people are out, again, however we choose to define out. But John does something surprising with our normal ideas of judgment, doesn't he? If we combine what Hebrews 13 says with what John says in Revelation 14... A very interesting image emerges. The faithful 
those whom Christians might be tempted to say are in are reminded that Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify people through his own blood. And then he connects Jesus' actions straight to what our response should be. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. And why on earth would we do that? For here, the author tells us, we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. In other words, maintaining what we have now is not our goal. Building, surrounding ourselves by, by belief systems and structures and keeping people out and away from us and, and keeping ourselves protected from those really bad people, that is not what we are here for as Christians. We aren't here preserving what we have always known because this city, if you will, these structures that we build for ourselves will not last. Rather, we seek, as those in um, Hebrews 11 did, the city that is to come The same city Jesus shed his blood to create, a holy city, a bride, as Revelation 21 describes it. And so I'd like to end this episode then with a quote that I saw this past week on social media. I'm very thankful for it. Uh, There's a lot of stuff that comes across my Facebook feed and lots of it is not pleasant, but lots of it is. And um, I found one this week that was a, a, a gem and I considered it a blessing to have read it this week um, because it fits with what we're talking about in Revelation 14. But it's a quote from Leslie Newbegin from his book, Foolishness to the Greeks. And these words were penned in 1988, but they could just have easily been written yesterday, particularly as they may apply to the church's stance right now regarding racism in this country, as well as many of the ensuing protests, some peaceful, some not, that have sprung up all over the country in response. I don't know that there are too many places right now where we are getting more of a who's in, who's out, than right now regarding our response to what is happening to the injustices. You have one side who seems to be very concerned that property is being damaged and violent riots are breaking out and we need to come in with a strong hand and squelch the riots. We then have some on the other side who say, your concern for property, while all good and fine, has actually been ignoring the very lives that have been suffering under the hand of oppressive um, actions for several um, decades, several generations, and now people are crying out as a result of their oppression, and we need to listen to their voices, not silence their anger. Now, where you fall on this line is, again, part of what I'm trying to help us think through is looking at judgment, looking at salvation, and seeing them sometimes as two sides of the same coin. But Newbegin says this, the place of the church is thus not in the seats of the establishment, but in the camps and marching columns of the protesters. The protesters contend that as Jesus was crucified outside the wall of the city, So the place of the Christian must always be outside the citadel of the establishment and on the side of its victims. On the side of its victims. This is what Jesus did. And you know what? It got him killed. And the same fate may await others who faithfully witness to the pattern of the Christ in this fallen world. And that's okay because we are investing in a city that is to come. A city, according to Hebrews 11.10, that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And I think this is what John wants our imaginations to be captured by, is to recognize our tendencies to stay inside the gates, inside the walls, where it's safe, where we know ourselves, where there are no risks, where there is no danger, where we will not be misunderstood, we were, where we will only be embraced and helped and loved and where we feel comfortable and competent to operate. And John and the author to the Hebrews and Jesus himself are inviting us outside the camp to go where the victims are to go where those are placed on Roman crosses and put to death because of their threat to the Roman Empire. Jesus experienced this fate. 
And as a church, as his body and as his bride, we are called to follow him there, to bear the reproach he endured, not to back off of our faithful witness for fear of we not knowing what to say or knowing what will happen or knowing what type of opposition we will face. And so I think the church is very uniquely positioned. If we follow Newbigin's advice, we go on the side of its victims. Are there people today victimized by unfair um, treatment of their property? Sure, there are. How do we go and sit with them? How do we go and love them? How do we go and support them in the middle of what they're facing? And how do we speak about justice and righteousness in a world right now where our African-American brothers and sisters are not entirely convinced that their voices have been heard, that their plight has been seen as the victims that, that many of them are, as the ways and the systems and the structures have treated individuals, when and where can we side with them without at the same time saying that it is okay for the violence to break out? But are we aware that 90 to 95% of the protesting is in fact peaceful? Are we listening to that? Is that making a difference? These are questions that we have to ask, but to sit back in our own private, safe, comfortable places and lob out accusations or lob out critiques about what's happening outside the city without being willing to go to those places ourselves in the flesh is not the position the church wants to be in. As Newbegin puts it, the church, the place of the church is thus not in the seats of the establishment, right? Like in our own buildings, in our own institutions, but in the camps and the marching columns of the protesters. The protesters contend that as Jesus was crucified outside the wall of the city, so the place of the Christian must always be outside the citadel of the establishment and on the side of its victims. And I think that ties together, at least in my mind, how I think we can look at this judgment as also potentially salvation for those blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, but recognizing that the Lord will right every wrong. He will make everything good and true once again. And the church wants to be on the correct side of that, both now and then looking toward the true age to come, which will be a continuation of the same type of righteousness and justice that we fought for and upheld here. We follow the pattern of the Christ. We embody his reality as a church and we look for that city, which is to come the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. That's the picture. That's where life is headed. That's where all of redemption is aimed. And that is what we want to actively be a part of of. And so that's all the time I'm going to take for this week. I'm very thankful for you continuing to listen in. Please leave me a rating or review on whatever podcast app you choose to listen to these on. Thank you as well for my supporters who are supporting me on a monthly basis. If you would like to support me at a 99 cents or 4.99 a month or 9.99 a month, it helps me to get resources that I need to continue to make these podcasts possible. I have several interviews lined up over the next couple of months that I'm very excited to share with you some more by the book episodes and so be be looking for those in the weeks to come. But if you would like to support the efforts of what I'm trying to do through Unbinding the Bible, there should be a link you can follow in the show notes at the very bottom of the show notes in each of these episodes, which will take you to a place where you can become a monthly supporter. Really appreciate your encouragement. Appreciate you reaching out via email. If you have comments or questions, you, and you may after an episode like this, that's great. You can reach me at unbindingthebible at gmail.com. Until next time, have a great week.